We have a lot of fun together, but just so understanding. Similar upbringing. His mother also has schizophrenia. Yeah. So let's just pause there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not healthy. <laughs> well, no, I, no, I wasn't saying it's not healthy. But that's a very. This is an interesting statistic, right? Because, right? You know, what is? Yeah. The, I, I mean, I, I'd have to look up the stats on rates of schizophrenia. But the fact that the two of you found each other, yeah, that's a very interesting. What was the moment like when you realized you both had mothers that were schizophrenic? Yeah, it was like again maybe unhealthy, but at the time I was like, oh my god, this is so sexy, <laughs> so hot, oh my god, make out with me now, you know. <laughs> we just had the wildest sex. It was like, oh my god, I'm being seen for the first time. I could see your whole life now. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was um, it was like that. But、um, we were already getting along、right. and had the same sense of humor and empathy and compassion for people,、um, and that was really important. To me, you know,、mm-hmm. and to him too, and then that just like made sense when he revealed that his mom also has the same thing. You know, it can't just be like, oh, your mom too. Well, <laughs> let's get married. It's like you know, we have to get along. The conversation has the conversations have to be flowing.、Right. So, so note to our note to our listeners and viewers: just because you meet someone <laughs> whose parent has the same diagnosis as yours, You're not supposed to get married. That doesn't mean you have to get married. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's gonna break down. It's a breakdown. She's gonna break it down. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik. I'm Jonathan Cohen. And welcome to our breakdown. Here we are. Here we are. We're gonna break down a very specific person today with a very specific haircut. <laughs> We came to this episode in a slightly unusual way. I was watching television, laughing out loud, yes, by myself, and texted you that you had to watch this special. You were absolutely more right about that than anything else you've ever suggested to me. And I very, very rarely reach out to anyone on Instagram because I don't think that's the way to communicate with people. But I posted that I was watching this special, and I tagged this comedian, and I was like, "I want this person to come chat with us." This person is Atsuko Okatsuka. Uh, she's a stand-up comedian, actor, and writer. She's based here in LA. She was born in Taiwan, spent her childhood in Japan, and、um, such such an interesting history. She grew up with、um, a lot of chaos, a lot of uncertainty in her in her early childhood. She was brought to the United States thinking it was vacation. She talks about this in her special.、Um, The intruder, but I, I think it's best for us to welcome Atsuko Akatsuka and let let her do the talking, and also specifically the talking about her hairdo, which is awesome. Break it down.、Uh, welcome Atsuko Akatsuka to the breakdown. We're huge fans, and、um, how would you describe your comedy? Oh my gosh! You know, there's observational comedians. Sure. There's、uh, storyteller comedians. Yeah. Your style of comedy, you might describe as. Oh God, it's so. I was hoping you would tell me. I well, was I hoping... mean, there's 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 an absurdist <laughs> twinge to it in the best way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. It's not really satirical. <laughs> sure. I'm、yeah. just thinking of all the genres that I know. This kind of I always say people always say like. Oh, gosh, because you should know like your brand, and you know th- that's why I keep the bowl cut. Or like you gotta <laughs> stay consistent. You gotta be easy to describe, right? They say stars are easy to do,、uh, like impressions of. Oh, you know,、mm. right? Because、right? they're memorable and very unique. Right. And、uh, gosh, I think you know. So I learned English、uh, by watching Scooby Doo, <laughs> and I think that's my style. <laughs> <laughs> that's. The best I could describe it.、Um, the Scooby Doo brand of comedy. The Scooby Doo brand. So、yeah. I,、um, your, your recent special,、um, the, the intruder. intruder. This is your debut. Also, it was directed by Tig Notaro. We've、yes. spoken to Tig. We're huge fans of yes. Tig. Yes.、Um, The New York Times hailed it as the best debut special of 2022. You were also named one of Variety's top comics to watch、um, that same year, and.、Um, You know, when I saw your special, I was really struck by yes. There's definitely like, a, oh, this is a distinctive person, which I think is important. I mean, especially in our culture now. 
Like sure, there's, sure. You know, do you want to be forgotten exactly. or remembered? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're very memorable. Um, and also there's um there's a, a really comforting kind of tangential method to the way that you kind of present yourself, meaning there are things that don't seem like they're gonna circle back and they always do. Mm. Um, there's a a really, a really clear comedic kind of through line. And also um you're you're a very physical comedian. And you actually talk about where some of your physicality came from. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Right. Yeah. I hope this is sometimes, you know, I'll tell stories and I'm like, oh, that was not consistent <laughs> with another story. So hopefully this is what you heard. I'll keep you honest. <laughs> well, I mean, I do have sort of a dance background. And then, you know, with the learning English through Scooby-Doo, that's a cartoon. You know what I mean? And Scooby-Doo was very physical. Um, and so when I was learning English, when I was learning comedy, you know, the comedies, the stand-ups or the comedians I was watching were physical comedians like Lucille Ball or Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, mm. because without language, you know, universally you're understood. Mm. And so I didn't know English, but they were making me laugh just through their physical bodies and and expressions on the face. And I think, you know, I really take to that mm -hmm. because... That's how I was communicating with people, too, when I first came here, mm -hmm. you know. And, yeah, I still don't feel like I know enough English words to be able to sometimes uh, communicate, like I'm doing right now. Like, You're doing great. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> so I just, you know, do facial Sometimes Jonathan's like that. He's Canadian. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we sort of, we, we have moments where... It's mostly, ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, ah, ah. And she's like, you're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um so you you have um a a unique a unique family situation and before we even get into the components of your life that um I think are particularly profound um you, you have a family history of your mother had schizophrenia and also epilepsy um but you you come from a a Japanese and Taiwanese family. Mm -hmm. And those those are two things that often do not occur in the same family. Your parents <laughs> met on a dating show? Yeah, that my Your grandma... Your father is Japanese? My father's Japanese. My mother's... You guessed it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, oh, I'm going to say stuff people already... <laughs> yeah, Taiwanese. The one that I didn't mention yet. Um, yeah, and my grandma, you know, didn't have enough, like, I think... You know, back then, right, it's like if you're a woman in your 30s, it's like, mm. what's wrong with you? Mm. You know, I've always asked my grandma why she didn't believe my mom could just find a boyfriend in Taiwan where mm. they were living. You know, just have her go to a coffee shop or whatever. <laughs> and my grandma was, I think my grandma just always knew that mm. my mom, you know, was different mm -hmm. and worried and so try to get ahead of that she always tries to do that and so signed my mom up on some like a game show or some sort of dating and it show. was a japanese dating show in shinjuku yeah in uh, tokyo yeah okay. it, it was she saw it in the papers and my mom had expressed interest in maybe trying something like that too i guess and so. for for people who don't know China and Japan are two very different cultures. They're different places. Yes. It's not like it's all the same. Meaning it's, it's the a, same with Taiwan. Yeah. Right, exactly. Right. And Taiwan as well. So um just We're go ahead. also talking about many years ago. Like now it's like, oh, I met right. on a dating show, everyone's on Love is Blind or whatever the Netflix <laughs> yes. show is. This is like before that time and before it became popular to meet in different ways. That's like quite unique. Right, right. You know, trendsetters <laughs> truly is... Was it like three women and he had to choose? Was it that? Or was she the lady and there were three guys? I'm so curious. That would have been so cool if it was my mom like bachelorette style. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Oh my God. No, it was like there were enough men and enough women. Got it. So hopefully you match up. If you don't, what's wrong with you? <laughs> we found the right amount on both sides, you know. So it was very, <laughs> it was very binary. It was very, you know, it's still high high stakes, right. I think. Um, and then my dad and my mom, I, my dad, I guess, like chose my mom or something. And then they went on a date right after that. Mm. That was not like on air or anything. And then... Um, yeah, and then after like a few dates, they mm -hmm. decided to get married. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're an only child, correct? I'm an only child between those two. Got it. Yeah, okay. 
And um, it was after you were born that some of your mom's, I guess, uniqueness became more apparent. Um, and you you describe yourself as being brought up by your grandmother. So that would be your, your mom's mom. Mm -hmm. Was your mom around or was she getting treatment? Like, what was what was that like? Yeah, it's wild because sometimes I try to remember, you know, growing up, my grandma's always there. Even mm. when I look back to pictures, it's her like hanging on to me for dear mm. life. And my mom's like right next to her in the picture. Mm. <laughs> but mm. I don't super, you know, remember her doing things with me, my mom. So my grandma always took initiative, I think, mm -hmm. would take me to the park, take me to school you know, go shopping. Mm -hmm. And then I think she would just leave my mom behind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of what my mom was up to. And when you, when you kind of, um, you know, think back and you've really eloquently described, you know, some of what that felt like, um, you know, you've talked a lot about having a lot of time to yourself, mm -hmm. um, seeking a lot of distraction, um, and also being kind of a source of distraction then for your mother as she struggled. Um, yeah. Do, you know, was that something like from as long as you can remember? Was that something that came out more when you were, because you came to America at 10, is that right? I realized recently it was mm -hmm. eight. Oh, okay. And then I just blacked out two years or something. <laughs> okay. It happens. I've learned a lot more recently about mm. the family's past uh -huh. because I just came back from Japan and Taiwan. And wow. so, and so right now, if the way I'm describing my grandma's son was, kind of sounds like she's an antagonist. It's mm. because I've sort of learned recently that she kind of was. Mm. Like, always, like, you know, having her hand in things. And mm -hmm. um, I love her. But, yeah, she was always assuming, mm -hmm. oh, your mom won't be able to do it, you know, and so getting ahead of things. But, um, sorry. So back to the question. Yeah, uh -huh. like, what, what, what was, what were your memories, both of kind of feeling a lot of, uh, aloneness, but then right. also wanting to engage with your mom. Um, we had Dan Matthews on who wrote a really beautiful book about um, his mother who wasn't diagnosed uh, with schizophrenia until she was in her 70s, I believe. Wow. Um, yes. And so his Why whole, tell her? Well, so... <laughs> Why so, tell her at 70? But he talked about that, like, he just knew that, like, his mom was different. And they just, there were all these accommodations that were made. And uh -huh. she had sort of, like, imaginary friends. And it was just, like, kind of this quirk. But it sounds like you had, you know, a very different a experience. <laughs> well, She's know. so quirky. <laughs> she needs help, Dan. <laughs> she needs help. He also talked a lot about how they were always moving. Yes. Like, they were never oh, wow. in yeah. an apartment very long, or uh -huh. they often didn't have electricity. But and nobody, like, put it No one put it together. together. Sure. But, like, a lot of those things sound like a typical household, right. like, American household that's just, like, struggling financially, we're possibly. All mess. We're all just moving around all the time. Hey, I'm an American, too. <laughs> Count me in. Right now, I'm getting the house painted because <laughs> we're trying to not, we're doing MTV Cribs. <laughs> Uh, sorry, <laughs> I wasn't like, I said it to the camera, like, <laughs> like they were like, bitch, when you go on a podcast, <laughs> you gotta say our name, MTV Cribs. Uh, Erring okay. on, <laughs> insert the graphic. Erring, not sure yet, but, um, Okay, so let's go back right, to so when you were, so Dan, when you were young, yes, mm -hmm. so what was it like in those kind of early years? What was your sort of awareness of what her needs were versus what your needs were? Yeah, yeah. I always, I still, I have a hard time figuring out my needs, actually, mm. even still to this day, maybe because I always put it aside as a kid. So I have no idea what my needs were mm. as a kid. <laughs> like, looking back, I have no idea what my dreams were, mm. what I really wanted. It was more just like, how do I, I think I became like my grandma. How do I get ahead of, oh, I think my mom's acting up again. Mm. Uh, mm. <laughs> hey, you know, I would do a dance or mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, oh, we would play characters. I would give her like a stick that's like our wand and we would ward off the bad guys, mm -hmm. you know, um, and stuff that would make her laugh or make her forget mm -hmm. whatever was going on in her brain that I didn't understand mm -hmm. uh, is what I was up to. And so, yeah, sometimes, you know, people are like, I, I, I think I have a later self-awareness of... Mm -hmm my own feelings. My and Bialik's Breakdown is supported by Athletic Greens. I use Athletic Greens every day because I want to work on my gut health. That was like a big reason that I started with Athletic Greens. And I'm the kind of person who always thought you have to take a million pills, but you don't. 
With one scoop, you absorb 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day right. It's a special blend of ingredients to support gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, everything. It's lifestyle-friendly, so whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, maybe you're dairy-free or gluten-free, it's for you. Also, contains less than one gram of sugar. Also, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, and it tastes good. AG1 is a micro habit with macro benefits. It's something you can do every single day to take great care of yourself. Right now, reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. One scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash breakdown. Again, athleticgreens.com slash breakdown to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by ZocDoc. You've been stewing about a health problem you have. You almost resort to texting your group chat to get your friends' opinions. While you're extremely unlikely to find quality medical advice in your group chat, you can find it from a doctor on ZocDoc. Thousands of medical professionals on ZocDoc are there to help you. They listen like a friend and give you the expert care you need. ZocDoc's the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. No more Dr. Roulette or scouring the internet for questionable reviews. With ZocDoc, you have a trusted guide to connect you to your favorite doctor that you haven't met yet. Millions of people use ZocDoc's free app to find and book a doctor in their neighborhood who's patient-reviewed and fits their needs and schedule just right. Go to ZocDoc.com breakdown, download the ZocDoc app for free, then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's ZocDoc.com breakdown, ZocDoc.com breakdown. Was your dad around in your childhood? He was. He was. And that's something I discovered recently Mm. is that my dad actually had full custody of me Mm. that whole time. And he lived down the street from us in Japan. Mm. But um, he would let my mom and grandma see me because he was like, that's your kid too, you know. Mm. Um, But then they would take advantage of that time. Mm. And so sometimes it's like... You get Atsuko for two weeks, but then they would hang on to me for like a month. Mm. Sometimes they would, they would test it and take me to Taiwan mm. for two months, you know. And then eventually, they took me to the States. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> she kidnapped me. I'm, I don't mean to laugh. And you talk yeah, about this in your special, me. but um, that's, a, that's a real thing that yeah. you were brought here. You, you didn't realize that, correct, at the time. Yes. Like, that's not what it felt like. Yeah, no, I, it was. It felt like a vacation because I was told it was. Hmm. Same with my dad. My dad didn't know I was moving here. Hmm. So I was, I don't know, what's that? I, I think it's a kidnapping. Mm-hmm. It's an Amber Alert. Yeah. I, uh, alert, alert, sorry, this is my impression of an alert. <laughs> alert, alert, Boeing 734, <laughs> if you see one... Or whatever we took to come here. But that part of your special, which is obviously very painful, Uh I was dying laughing because your delivery, you talk about, you know, the brainwashing that happened growing up. Right. That was one of the moments of the special where I just (laughs) texted my mom. I was like, no, wait a second. You have to watch this (laughs) right away. That's so sweet. I, I don't want you to feel bad. I don't want the audience to ever feel bad. I want them to feel seen. And maybe that's a problem. You know, some comedians can really live in the emotions. But I'm like, no, I want you to feel seen. So, like, I don't, I won't sit in the sadness too long. Mm. I want you to have seen the parts that I overcame, you know. And I want you to be laughing. Comedy first for me. It's also the absurdity of it, you know. Sure. It's yeah. like... <clears throat> to go on a vacation and then end up in America. <laughs> right. And you talk about how, you know, for a while you still didn't know. Yeah. You know, you had to sort of like put, the, no one told you, you had to put the pieces together. You were undocumented, but you didn't know that <laughs> until you were almost a legal adult. Right. Yeah. It's... Like you you didn't even come legally. It was like, there were a lot of surprises. So many. And it's like, I'm just trying to, I don't, yeah, it was a I think that's why I'm still stunted, you mm. know, because it was a lot of like, 
Yeah, a lot of like having to live in the present, but then also backtracking. A lot of backtracking, but like the pieces weren't there. Um, yeah, so, and it was so, and it's, you know how silly it is to tell people you're undocumented when you find out at 17, <laughs> right? And they're like, oh my God, like from a t- war-torn country? And you're like, oh no, uh, Tokyo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you sound insane. Well, look, you you were you were in a somewhat insane, you know, situation. Like right. it was, uh, objectively speaking, that was a very unusual way. Did you come, where did you come to in America? I moved to L.A., yeah. And they just enrolled you in school? Yes. Yeah. Where did you go to school? I went to uh, Richland Elementary. Okay. Which is like in West Los Angeles. It's just called it. West Los Angeles. And uh, which sounds fancy. Yeah. You know, West, <laughs> just West. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And what's that like to show up? You don't speak the language. You haven't watched enough Scooby-Doo yet. Right. So what are those like first years? What are you making? Because now you realize, wait a second, school doesn't usually happen on a vacation, especially a new school. I did summer school. And Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, summer school is going to be my two-month summer vacation. Fun. I'm learning English there. I'm watching Scooby-Doo at home. (laughs) And, you know, made some friends even. I can't wait to tell my Japanese friends about this when I go back. And then fall came. And then it was like, you're going to school again. A different one (laughs) in the fall. The one right down the street. And (laughs) so I was like, oh, God. Like, (laughs) that's not two months. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So what are you thinking at that time? How how are you making sense? Thinking, yeah. Jonathan. Okay, because if You're I just were, on pilot, yeah, automatic pilot. I was in shock. I was a little scared. Probably, I think in retrospect, I was a little scared of the truth. Mm-hmm. So I was af- afraid to ask too many questions because I was already sad. I was mm-hmm. so sad, and you know that I had this feeling. Oh my God! I didn't say bye to my dad. Mm-hmm. I didn't say bye to my friends in Japan, and I don't know how the law works. So I I have no idea. All I know is that we were scared of my mom finding out that I was even feeling sad because then she would get upset, throw things, things like that. She Mm -hmm. would act up. So I just kept quiet, went through school. Wow, a whole year passed, you know. Mm. I think I took a while to make friends because in my head I was like, I'm going back. Mm. So like I might not, I might as well not get too close to anyone here. And then, you know, I should have because... (laughs) Cut to 10 years later. <laughs> now I'm as an adult, I'm like, how do you make friends? How how do you make how do you make friends? So what what were you like as a kid? Were you were you were quirky? You kept to yourself? I kept to myself. I did have friends. Like I, you know, it was it's like cultural. So, mm-hmm. you know, the two Asian kids in class whose parents also spoke Mandarin, mm-hmm. like my grandma, uh, I those were like the the people I hung out with. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah. So it was like, it still had to be like through something convenient. Yeah. Hmm. I am curious. Yeah. Do you ever, after like a year you're in school, do you ever ask your grandma, like, are we going back? Like, how does that reconcile? Right. Yeah. I, um, that's something I've been trying to remember. And I asked my, I asked my grandma about this recently. I actually like recorded the conversation because I wanted to know hmm. And like I said, I think I didn't ask. Or when I have said, I want to go back crying, Mm -hmm. my grandma would sort of shush me because Mm -hmm. she was afraid mom would hear. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a lot of that unhealthy, like, don't talk about it because we're also, there was also my mom as a factor that we were scared of. Hmm. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because it's often the you know, the the person often with the least kind of support or recovery, you know, depending on what the ism is, you know, or what the disorder is or the mental, you know, health challenge, the person with kind of the most loudness in that sense sort of sets the tone, you know, for the whole house. That's true. And and you hear people talk about alcoholism like this and, you know, you, you hear... You know, that it's kind of like that person is sort of who everything revolves around, Mm -hmm. meaning the walking on eggshells and like having to, you know, and it's, you know, the irony is that the people who gain the most health or recovery, you know, often are the people who have to do the most work, you know, the most Mm. kind of dancing around it. Um, Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that sounds um, very accurate. Um, So you've talked a little bit about, 
eating stuff. And people call it different things. People call it disordered eating. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go into as what, little— What else? Uh, I, are there other terms? <laughs> the, no, I want to know these other terms. Well, Maybe meaning I, I don't— some people don't want to share what kind of disordered eating oh. you know that they that uh -huh. they experienced but um i i am curious because you know a lot of times especially for young people you know we try and find something to control mm -hmm. in a situation that feels th like it's out of control so i'm wondering when you kind of noticed you know things like that or other you know kind of things you did to compensate, essentially, right? To try and create a sense of control. And I think especially in um, in many traditional cultures where, you know, children's feelings, it's not that people don't care about children, but the notion of like, how are you actively feeling right now? Like, mm. you know, even me growing up, and I think you probably had a similar experience, you know, parenting of a certain generation was kind of like, I, I like to joke, you know, my parents told me when I was hungry, told me when I was hungry. Mm. They told me when I was cold. Mm -hmm. They told me when I was sad. And they told me when I was happy, you know? And right. like, that was just, it was a style of parenting. And it's like, wow. if I need to hear from you, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, but but a lot of times kids then, depending on their personality, will try and do things to feel a sense of control. Yeah. Is that what food stuff felt like for you? Like, do you remember? And I don't know when that started. For sure. Yeah, that's, that's what it was. And it, took me like reading to figure that out. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's like in the sense that you were saying your parents told you when to eat and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was like when I was reading, I was told, oh, you're trying to control something. Mm -hmm. And I just needed an answer. Mm -hmm. I, I can't just I, to my actions. So, but in retrospect, I think it was right. Um, yeah, like in the sixth grade, mm -hmm. around sixth grade, I had gone to a school that's not in the same neighborhood. Uh, I think we used someone else's address to go to school in Brentwood, oh, yeah. where O.J. Simpson lived. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, that's, you know, it'll be better. There's more money there, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I think I felt the pressures of a new school again. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And the kids were, like, rich and yeah. white and just different and, you know. I went to school with O.J.'s son, <laughs> mm. you know? Wow. And they weren't nice to him. And I didn't know what was happening. It's not like I was, you know, I knew the news. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, I think the pressures of it made me want to control even more. Mm -hmm. So then I did it through, like, fitness and calorie counting. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That um, sense of restricting. It can be very comforting, you know, for a lot of people. In um, a weird way, I wish I had parents that told me when I was happy and stuff. Mm. <laughs> is that messed up? I know that's, I mean, not to like, yeah. be like, oh, your trauma is, but yeah. And mm. I don't know what kind of parenting that's called. Is that like, I don't know, helicopter? No. Well, I think, well, I think more what, what I was talking about is, you know, sort of this notion of like, you know, um, the, the simplest example, and I, I have kids, so I remember mm -hmm. experiencing this as a parent, you know, when my kids were little. And, you know, I have I have two boys, and they have very different body types. Mm -hmm. One is, like, um, often cold, and the other's never cold. But okay. in my mind, I'm I like— I didn't see that coming. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, in my mind, I'm like, but you have to wear a jacket. Like, that's my—right? That's the rule in my head. But when you have a child that's old enough to say, I'm not cold. Right. The the sort of response that that— progressive modern parenting is to say, I'm going to trust that that child mm. can regulate their body enough to know I'm cold or I'm not. And the kind of parenting that I experience, and my parents are first generation, my mother was first generation American, my father was half first generation American, mm -hmm. you know, the notion was like, you're cold. <laughs> like you're going to put on the jacket. And, and if you say you don't want it, you're still going to put it on. And even if we're going to have like a dumb fight about it where everybody's crying and screaming, <laughs> I know that you're cold. And, you know, while it sounds like a minor thing mm. to the mind of a child, what ends up happening, you want to guess? They don't trust themselves. That's right. Okay. I was curious what the effect yes. is. Do I, I know? Maybe just, I'm not cold. Maybe I'm not like, I don't think I'm hungry, but she's telling me to eat, right? Oh. Or, or, or even like, you know. Your, your reality twisting. It's, it's reality twisting. Right. So like, I don't think I have to go to the bathroom, which it's one thing, like, at a certain <sighs> age, you want to say to a kid, like, go to the bathroom before we get in the car, because kids don't understand we're going to be in a whatever, five-hour car ride. But for other things, it was kind of like, yeah. There's a bad joke in my house that is, 
what is a sweater? Uh-huh. It's the thing that you put on when your mother is cold. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very true. Wow. This is like, you know, I'm learning a lot about this parenting style. Wow. That's so yeah. funny and, and sad. Sad. Yeah, I'm no, here. but and it's look, <laughs> everybody has their reality twisting that they've experienced. But it sounds wow. like you were given an enormous amount of freedom, hmm. not maybe told when you were hungry or cold or yeah. tired. You had to figure it out for yourself, but also you're living in the shadow of all this uncertainty that you don't know how to manage. Right. Yeah. And so I don't know what personality that comes, that brings up, but yeah. My armchair psychology uh, practice over here uh -huh. <laughs> would imagine making assumptions here that you're searching for some sort of knowable. If you're dealing with all this unknowable, mm -hmm. both coming to America and then switching schools and sort of, you, you know, do you, do you feel comfortable that this new school you're going to stay in, for example, or do you have in the back of your mind that you may go to another school or something else might change. So I would imagine that in the face of all these unknowns, mm -hmm. how do you, you, you must imagine that there may be some other unknown that's going to come at any moment. Right, right, right. My Bialik Breakdown is supported by Element. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means just the right amount of salt and no sugar. It contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, 60 milligrams magnesium, none of the junk, no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited to folks following a keto, low-carb, or paleo diet. Electrolytes facilitate hundreds of functions in the body, like the conduction of nerve impulses, hormonal regulation, nutrient absorptions, fluid balance. Element can help prevent and eliminate headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue, sleeplessness, and other common symptoms of electrolyte deficiency you didn't even know were caused by electrolyte deficiency. Element is used by everyone, from NBA, NFL, and NHL players, Olympic athletes, Navy SEALs, to everyday moms and dads, and exercise enthusiasts. When you sweat, the primary electrolyte lost is sodium, and athletes can lose up to 7 grams per day. Right now, Element is offering our listeners a free sample pack with any purchase, and I've tried it. It's delicious. I've tried many flavors. You get eight single-serving packets free with any Element order, and it's a great way to try all eight flavors or share Element with a salty friend. Get yours at drinkelement.com slash mayam. This deal is only available through our link. Go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash Mayam. Element offers no questions asked refunds. Try it totally risk-free. If you don't like it, share it with a salty friend and they'll give you your money back. No questions asked. You've got nothing to lose. The next thing that I was going to ask is sort of, you know, the, um, the first, you know, kind of important relationship where we learn where we belong is with our parents. But the next one is sort of when we try and interact romantically with other people mm -hmm. because then all of the like, what do I trust? Who do I attach to? Who do I trust with my feelings, right? So I'm I'm curious, did you date? Yeah, I started dating like when I was 17. I was such a dreamer though. I had just my head in the clouds. I was just wanted romance so bad, you know, as like a preteen and even going into my teens, you know. Um, but I did not know how to talk to someone mm. that I was romantically interested in. Mm. I barely knew how to like really make friends, I think, you know. And so, yeah, I I dated someone when I was 17. I was like on the cheerleading squad. I had a little more confidence. <laughs> I had a crew, you know, I had friends. This is my friends. And, you know, maybe a status that was, like, made up on TV shows. Our our cheer squad was not, like, <laughs> what you would think. Like, it's not bring it on, girls. We were <laughs> DIY. You know, we had no money. You know what I mean? Yeah. We learned our own stunts. So that was messy. Um, and, <laughs> and, and then there was, uh, through Japanese school, through Japanese school, like, a friend there. Hmm. Japanese school is something you go to on Saturdays to freshen up on your Japanese every week. Um, and yeah, through a friend there, I met like my boyfriend, my first boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think the distance, the long distance, he lived like 30 minutes away mm -hmm. via freeway. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think it just made it so that I didn't feel as much pressure mm -hmm. to be like, you know, a good, fun, pretty girlfriend or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that distance was helpful. 
in trying to, you know, make my first boyfriend work. Right. Yeah. But then I attached really, really, really hard mm. and moved in eventually. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did all the things. Yeah. Yeah. What was your your grandma's and I guess, you know, your your mom to some extent, but what was your sort of family's perception of you branching out? Yeah, they didn't like it because I was doing it so intensely. Once I was like, I have a boyfriend, you know, I just like moved to Santa Clarita, you know. Mm. I moved in, I was ditching all the time because I didn't want to lose him. Mm. I was like, I love this new family. Mm. My other one's weird and scary and I mm. doesn't make me feel good. We were living in a garage, everything's cramped. Mm. You know, um, so, yeah, I just sort of ran. Hmm. And my grandma didn't like that because I was failing classes. And, you know, she would show up to school sometimes to see if I was there. And I wouldn't be there. She found pregnancy tests, you know. Oh, the whole bit. It was. I just went, ah, oh, I went <laughs> all out. I was like, this is me breaking hmm. free. Me being me, making my own decisions for the first time. But hmm. I wasn't, I was just going... You know, I was all or nothing. That's mm-hmm. I think that's why I did eat, and I had an eating disorder too. Mm. I was like, eat nothing or eat a lot. You know, yeah. yeah. And um, where did kind of where did that lead you? Did you end up staying with that person? Did you finish school? Did you like what? what where did that all land? Yeah. Also, I, the thought of my grandmother or parent showing up at school and me not being there sounds that sounds horrible. That sounds terrifying. Oh, I was so sad when yeah. I found out because. Um, like a teacher told me, you know, that your grandma came by. Wow. And she was really bummed. She came by knowing this is your last class. Right. And uh, she was really bummed you weren't here. Hmm. And, you know, that made me sad. But I was sort of rebelling and I was I was angry hmm. that, you know, I couldn't. Yeah. Like, I was like, I found a boyfriend, though. Hmm. He likes me and I like him. Hmm. So, like, that's that, you know? Mm-hmm. I was so afraid to lose him. Right. But, yeah. So you finished high school, though, correct? I finished high school. I had to make up a few classes. <laughs> <laughs> and then... The boyfriend clause. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and I uh, went, like, I got into UC Riverside. It was, like, the only mm. school I got into. So I was like, I'll go there. Mm. Um for a year and a half. And then I, I dropped out because it was so far away and I wanted to be close to my boyfriend. You know, like... Same boyfriend. Same boyfriend. Hmm. So uh, then I started doing community college with the boyfriend. That's where he was going. Hmm. So I was kind of just like making my life about him. Hmm. But it felt good for mm-hmm. me at the time. And then um, and then immediately after that, I sort of went into my next relationship. Hmm. Once... That felt too dark. Mm. Yeah, I think I kind of repeated the same thing with my mom and grandma. Mm. My first boyfriend was very emo and very sad about life. You know, his mom had like left him Mm. when he was a kid. So he was angry about that. His dad was always working, single dad. Uh, So yeah, my boyfriend would like watch like Nightmare Before Christmas. (laughs) You know, when that was emo. Uh I don't know if you remember. Yeah. Yeah, Right. Yeah. Like Nightmare Before Christmas, Tim Burton movies before it was cool right. at Hot Topic. You know, that was his whole thing. <laughs> Would wear black all the time. Right. Got it. Drink a lot. Um, and so I was like, oh, this isn't healthy here mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. And my eating disorder was still like a thing. Mm-hmm. So it was like coming back. So then I immediately started dating someone else. Wow. Yeah. What did you study in college? Psychology. <laughs> really? I yeah. Yeah. What uh, what drew you to that? <laughs> my I think my mom hmm. for sure. But also, you know, at that time, I think, you know, c- these like high school college counselors, you go into this room and you're supposed to submit applications. I guess the other kids have thought about it or hmm. talked to their parents about it. I didn't do that with my family. So they sat you down and they go, okay, now you're applying. You have to choose a major. Mm. Hurry, you have 30 minutes at the computer. <laughs> and it's like, ah, oh, what do I like? Uh, what do I like? Everyone else seems so confident, like, yes, I'm a math major, mm. blah, 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 historian. I've been, I've talked about this with my family since I was 10. I'm like, mm. not my family. They don't even know this. I'm in here in this computer room mm. right now. So 
I think psychology tends to be maybe a popular major <laughs> because people are like, well, I like people. Right. And I like thinking thinking about how people think. But for me, I think it was a huge part was my mom. Hmm. So then, yeah, that's what I do have an under a bachelor's in psychology. That's awesome. Yeah. And when did you start doing comedy? We're not going to find out what happened to the next relationship? Oh, well, I didn't want to make her go through every single relationship. (laughs) I only have been with three people. (laughs) Okay, so great. So this is number two. All right, so tell us what happened with this relationship. uh, No need. Well, he was also toxic, you know, because it was my teacher at the community college that I started dating. Oh. Yeah. And the same class that my my first boyfriend and I were in. Hmm. So, yeah, everything was just like, I just need family. Right. And then I stayed in that relationship for seven years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he was like 12 years older than me, you know, that kind of thing. I think I was like, well, now I look for a father or or whatever it was. Yeah. (laughs) And you're you're married currently. I'm married, yeah. And it sounds like happily. Yes. I mean, I guess you have to say that because we're asking you on the radio. (laughs) Oh, yeah. No, totally. He's like... (laughs) <laughs> the radio. The radio. Let's, let's just I identify that? that, everyone. The radio, yeah, we're, because we're on television. Um, so how did you <laughs> How did you end up meeting your now husband? We met through a friend, and it was like after these toxic relationships where I feel like I was able to grow e- enough before I started dating my husband. Mm. And um, he's just so... We have a lot of fun together, but just so understanding, similar upbringing. His mother also has schizophrenia. Yeah, so let's just pause there. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe it's not, maybe it's not healthy. (laughs) No, I I wasn't saying it's not healthy, but that's a very, this is an interesting statistic. Right. Because, you know, schizophrenia. Yeah. I I mean, I'd have to look up the stats on rates of schizophrenia, but the fact that the two of you found each other. Yeah. That's a very interesting. What was the moment like when you realized you both had mothers that were schizophrenic? Yeah, it was like, again, maybe unhealthy, but at the time I was like, oh my God, this is so sexy, (laughs) so hot, oh my God, make out with me now, you know? (laughs) We just had the wildest sex. It was like, oh my God, I'm being seen for the first time. I could see your whole life now, you know what I mean? It was um, it was like that, but huh. we were already getting along right. and had the same sense of humor and empathy and compassion for people, um, and that was really important to me, you know, mm-hmm. and to him too. And then that just like made sense when he revealed that his mom also has the same thing. Did he have similar experiences as you did with sort of that feeling of like loneliness and being a little bit of an outsider? Um, was that also kind of a, a a connecting point? Yeah, but yes, for sure. He, for other reasons, there was also like evangelical Christianity mm. and him being the middle brother. He was doing a lot of the caretaking for the mom. Got it. So yeah, yeah, but in different ways. One in 222 people okay. have schizophrenia. So Diagnosed, that's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah. okay, but even if it's a little higher, that's still, that's some pretty... That's some pretty special matching that the two of you did. I know, and and we have to like, you know, it can't just be like, oh, your mom too? Well, (laughs) let's get married. It's like, you know, we have to get along. The the conversations have to be flowing. So so note to our our listeners and viewers, just because you meet someone whose parent (laughs) has the same diagnosis as yours. You're not supposed to get married. That doesn't mean you have to get married. You don't have to. You still have to know each other and do all that. How long have you been married? We've been married six years, which <laughs> so uh, is what I tell people. And we have been married six <laughs> years. I talk about him in my stand-up, right. my husband, my husband. People have even called me the girl wife guy, you know, on stage <laughs> being like, my husband this, my husband that. He's uh-huh. my best friend. And <laughs> a few days ago, I was trying to get him on my health insurance. We're behind. We're both stunted people, similar upbringing, similar personalities. Um, we I, we have to get a copy of our marriage certificate to mm-hmm. prove so he, I could get him on my SAG health insurance. Anyway, the city of Los Angeles contacted us and they were like, "Hi, um, you're actually not married <laughs> <laughs> to each other, to anyone, really. <laughs> There's no records of you two being married at all. We just wow. found this out like a few days ago, which is you know so us, you know <laughs> it's it's so us. And uh, so are are so, you married? 
we fixed it. So, um, so yes, two wait two days ago. Yeah, we went and to the city of Los. I'm Angeles. sorry, you're gonna have to walk me back here. Hold okay. on, you're you, newlyweds now. <laughs> yeah, well, we. How's the honeymoon going? <laughs> I'm doing a podcast. I was like, oh, I'm going to Studio City. I'll see you later, honey. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on one second, though. I you, know. Okay, so no, but I just want to know what happened. So you you planned a wedding. This can happen, Maya. No, I'm certain that's true. You planned a wedding. Was it at— Six years ago. Okay, was it like at a— Are you sure? <laughs> we had a wedding. People flew out. It There's was at pictures. a venue? It was at a venue. Beautiful space. You had a, a, a officiant? Officiant was there. So what— was that person of a denomination? Uh, the queer community. Great. Okay. So yeah, queer, <laughs> but I'm saying, were were they a, a licensed? Uh, oh yes, they were a, a licensed person to do this. Right. So usually there's like paperwork that you file that didn't get filed. Yes. Got and it. I think it was maybe our friend, <laughs> our friend who officiated us, and my my husband's father is a preacher, <laughs> so he begged for us to. You know, he was like, please let me let me marry you. Please right. let me be the person. And we're like, no, no, you stand for homophobia. <laughs> we don't want that. We're going to, you know, get our queer friend to do it. Yes. To make a statement. And our queer friend failed us. <laughs> so his dad would be so stoked to know that. But yeah, he's, I think it was our friend who was supposed to turn it in, the marriage certificate. So this whole time, it's like, I wore a wedding dress, everything, you right. know? Yeah, only so, to find out this year. So, um, if, if you don't mind leaning into this a little bit, um, what what things are what other th what things are hard for you? Oh, like given my the God. way given the way you grew up. No, this is my everyday. You're right. Like we, I it turns out we were boyfriend and girlfriend this whole time. <laughs> you know, but, but our sex did get hotter for no reason. <laughs> so that's fun. You know, um, yeah. I just. I, I don't know. I have a goose backpack. I no, but I want to. I want to. <laughs> no, but I want to lean into this a little bit. It sounds like things uh, follow through. Uh huh. Is that? Would you say that's a category that's hard? Follow through. Oh, following through with yeah. things. Yes, a hundred percent. Structure. A structure. Yes. Got it. Two hundred percent. Are you? Um. Are you a person who's? Are you a person who like? Do you Thank struggle you. to be on time? Yes. I was late 10 minutes well, to this no, podcast. But, oh, I wasn't I wasn't mentioning <laughs> that. Um no, but I'm just trying to I'm trying to find the things. But um tell me some things that you feel are are special about you because of kind of the way you were raised. <laughs> I have talked about this to my fans where I'm like, look, I'm messy. This is my bathroom and I show it all. You know, yes, there's toothpaste on the mirror. I will get it right now, you know, and showing the messes of the house. Mm -hmm. Um and how I can be late to things because I'm blindly optimistic. Mm. But I am nice. <laughs> and, mm. and that's not enough. But I I do like people a lot. And it's not a general statement. It's not, I'm not choosing a major anymore. I I do have a deep, deep love for people and and empathy and yeah, just like to the point, I don't think about my like grief so much. I mm. rarely cry mm -hmm. just about me. I, I it's always for other people, mm. and so I don't know. I and my husband is very good about reminding me though. Like I know I there, I see all that kindness in you, but because you live in the with your head in the clouds, sometimes mm. you. You know, um, like I have missed things because I'm watching like a video of somebody reuniting with their dog or something, <laughs> you know, and been late. And my husband is good at grounding me and reminding me like, hey, that, that compassion needs to uh, and and thought of others needs to extend out because mm. when you're late, that's actually not thinking of others. And I'm like, mm. oh, my God, you're so right. You know, and so so. um not living in with my head in the clouds so much is something I'm learning. But mm -hmm. yeah, when did you find comedy? I, I, you have a a really interesting. Um, we read a quote that you 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 discovered Margaret Cho, mm -hmm. um, and she's someone we've had on. And actually, she um, recently was on an episode of my show. And um, I'm a huge fan of her, not just as a comedian, but as a, a person. And I'm I'm 
the the quote was something about you sort of saw that comedy has this ability to sort of transform, you know, trauma. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about sort of what it was like discovering her? I think you were 17 and then sort of if if that's where the comedy bug bit you. Yeah, I think I always liked like entertaining, whether it was like cheerleading or, you know, I found theater the last year of high mm. school too and uh, or performing for my mom with my mom to get the demons out or whatever, mm. but being a character. Um, I always liked doing that. I always liked making people laugh. But when I saw that it could be a job through Margaret Cho, <laughs> mm. you know, I was like, oh my gosh, this is her job. Like, she, it's <laughs> just her standing there. I didn't know it was an art form. Um, that's when I think I, um, it, it kind of stayed with me in the back mm. of my mind that I could do it too. And what was it, w was there something about the fact that she was an Asian woman also? I mean, you know, her comedy was, um, you know, at the time she was, she was a pioneer, you mm -hmm. know, in, in many ways and um, talked with us a lot about some of the challenges of that. And 100%. sort of the, yeah, so I'm wondering if that also kind of appealed to you. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, it helped that she was someone that looked like me mm -hmm. and was holding ground for an hour, just talking by herself. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and so, and then she, I think she had a, she, and then she had her TV show too, mm -hmm. which I didn't get to catch because I think that was before I caught her stand up. Right. Yeah. It's a lot. I know Margaret. I'm friends with her and it's, um, I always say, <sighs> The, the pressures of being the first, I'm happy to be like the 10th person to, <laughs> to have done something, you mm. know? And I'm only the second Asian woman after Margaret to have an HBO special. Wow. wow. You know? And so... It's incredible. And it's not something that I was like stoked to find out, but I was <laughs> like, wow, it, that took 23 years, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So it's just like hoping that... So it's... It, it was cool that that seed was planted and I was actually able to be the second, at least on HBO with a stand-up special, mm -hmm. you know. What was it like in the early days when you caught the bug and you were like, oh, I could do this? Did you start in open mics? Did you like start with three minutes? Like how was the early days of your comedy? Yeah, I uh, I started by taking a class mm -hmm. because I, I, I needed structure and I did know that about me. I, I I can't be trusted to just drive to an open mic and come out not having been kidnapped or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Drive to an and open mics back then were like in an alley. Mm -hmm. They're late. They go to like two in the morning. It's all dudes. You're maybe the one or two females there. Uh, it's not safe. It's how people go missing. Mm. And so, and I did know that. <laughs> So then I took an all-female stand-up class. Hmm. Mm. Where'd you take it? Um, in Studio City, I think. Okay, like a, a private place. Private place. It, it was uh, it, Lisa Sunstead's residence. It's mm -hmm. called Pretty Funny Women. Hmm. And so it was like a safe space to start like practicing jokes and bouncing ideas off of people. And it was like an immediate community you could find. Yeah. Did you have your kind of the voice that we know of as your sort of voice as a comedian? Was that what you were like from the get go? Or did you do standard <laughs> like a guy walks into a bar? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I was very deadpan back then. Mm -hmm. I think I was trying to sound like Tig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was like really, like really slow and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was vibe, slow vibe. And, uh, but then it, I found that my personality was kind of limiting for my personality mm. to continue doing that. So, yeah, they say it takes 10 years for you to really, really find your true voice in comedy. Mm. And I think that's true because sometimes you have to fight off the insecurities of trying to sound like other people, um, even by accident, because that's who you were watching when you were growing up or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, from the class, where do you go from there? Oh, yeah, from the class. So then there was like a graduation show and then other people. So you do like a five minutes and then other industry folks or bookers were there and then they would ask you to do their shows. And then you have to continue by going to, you do have to end up going to the open mics. But I had these female friends now who I took mm. the class with that I could go to mics with. So it was like strength in numbers. And then through that, you do, you know, other bookers see you and then you do other shows. So showcases and then you have your crew to do open mics. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, yeah, sometimes, but there were times where I took big breaks because I 
I was scared. I was mm. like, I don't know. I don't know if I believe in myself enough. Like, what if I'm what, like losing my mind and this isn't actually what I can do? To think something could be a career, you have to have so much confidence in yourself. And I didn't quite have that. So it took years. It wasn't until like 2015 after I graduated out of, out of art school that I really hit comedy harder. And as you were writing and as you were performing, you know, did you start to learn more about yourself? Meaning you have a lot of your own personal reflections in in your act and like right. how you grew up. So I'm wondering, as you're taking psychology classes, you can't, most people can't help but uh, ask questions about how they grew up and and how that's formed them. And then if you were telling personal stories in your comedy, that's probably like, did you start sort of trying to put the pieces together in, in sort of what was forming you? Yeah, but that took a while. At first, mm-hmm. I was like, how do I set up punchline? How do I write a set of punchline, mm-hmm. set of punchline? So things were coming out of my life, but I wasn't getting as deep yet. Mm-hmm. Because even when I was learning psychology, again, I assessed myself latest, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? So I didn't realize till way later. And, you know, I had to give myself permission to also be me and my authentic self, an open book. Mm-hmm. And that took some time, so... But it would come out in little tiny bits and punchlines. And do you feel like that was a shift? Like when you give yourself permission to be yourself and to be your authentic self, do you feel like that was a shift in your comedy? Oh, 100%. Yeah. And that was just like the last few years, I think. So you have a very distinctive style. um, And um, a a lot of people do love your hair in particular, which is awesome. Thank um, you. When, when did, did you have this hairstyle as a child and then came back to it? Or was <laughs> this just something that you took on as an adult? Yeah, I did have this as a baby. A lot of Asian kids have it as sure. a baby. A lot of just kids in general. Mm-hmm. And I think friars <laughs> and uh, some British men. Uh, <laughs> they do. They do. When I went to the UK, I was like, oh, wow. This is, uh, it was mostly men with my haircut. Okay, so then <laughs> uh, when did you return to it? I returned to it, yeah, a few or years ago. Or it returned to you, as it were. That's right. It's. I think it's actually, as Jonathan was asking, it's actually when I started embracing myself my mm. more, and it was coming out in my stand-up comedy. Then I was like, it just naturally, I was like, I want this bowl cut again. Hmm. I was just authentically just trying to be me everywhere. Okay, I have a couple more hair questions. Um, I know that people um, tag you specifically like right. to show their hair, which is adorable. <laughs> um, this is just a question. Do you ever wear it other ways? Like when you're at home, like do you put it up in a little ponytail? Do you <laughs> part it on the side? In the tiniest ponytail. <laughs> uh, sometimes I do curl it oh. a little bit to give it a perm. My mom and grandma have a perm, so I'm like, why not complete it? <laughs> Three's you know, three's company. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, um, I sometimes do permit, but that's so, you know, maybe for a very special occasion. Right. Um, yeah. What about a hair band that like the tennis players wear just Ooh, to get yeah, it off show of my your forehead? Okay, so I was going to say, I have two choices. You either have no forehead <laughs> right. or your forehead starts like at the top of your head. That's how- Can we see your eyebrows? Of course, yes. Oh my God, I'm so nervous. I'm so shy. Are you ready? I want to see them. Okay, what if there's a third eye there? I, I mean, anything <laughs> could happen under there. <laughs> what if I have... And we would be the ones to tell you. Like, you got this far okay. in life. It's a tiny forehead. Oh, you do have oh. a tiny forehead. It's so tiny. You look very need... different with your hair. Up. Right? This is protagonist. This is a protagonist yes. look. Well, actually, protagonist is middle part, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> it, this is leading lady. This is, le- this is leading lady. And that's you. Villain. No. Most Super villains, villain. right? Villains have like a blunt bang, dark hair. Yeah, but that's because people's perceptions of Asian women are so fucked up. Thank you so much for saying that. It's true. <laughs> Look, um, I actually um, wonder if you can just speak a little bit to you know you. You really have two distinctive cultures, you know, as sort of equal parts of your life, mm-hmm. and you know you mentioned going to Japanese school, right? Um, but also. You know, you grew up with Mandarin. Mm -hmm. Do you, do do people, I mean, obviously I'm asking you about it, but is this something in the Asian community that comes up in terms of what do you, do you resonate more with one or the other or because you were raised by your grandmother, is that more dominant? Where do you kind of fall with that? 
you know, outwardly, people think I'm Japanese. And right. so in my comedy, I rarely even talk about the Taiwanese part of me because mm. my full name sounds like I'm Japanese. Sure. And, you know, maybe people don't even know where Taiwan is. No. I think <laughs> you they know just what think I mean? it's all like, she's Asian. <laughs> right. Or like it's Thailand or something, <laughs> you know, like, and that's happened where Thailand, you know, had a big, big earthquake and so many people sent their condolences to me. And, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it it's it's hard, but like they both equally mean so much to me. Japan was mm -hmm. my home and I would go back to Taiwan a lot, though. And my mom and grandma are Taiwanese. And so uh, the way their history, their their um, ways of living and mm -hmm. the culture passed down to me through them means a lot, too. So I'm I'm just like all encompassing immigrant, but yeah, I, you know, I think my mannerisms are more Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. um, they're islanders. They're very welcoming people. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan, like near where I'm from, near Tokyo, is like more city, but colder people. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're just like, it's like New York. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, but quieter or something, <laughs> <laughs> you know, where the, I, I got my own stuff to do. So what? You fell? Sorry, I might not help you. You know, it's like that. That's Tokyo. And I don't feel like that's really me. Yeah. Yeah. But they both make up me. Before we let you go, what what is next for you? What do you want to do? Meaning, obviously, you you have, I'm sure, a lot more comedy in you. Um, mm -hmm. And also you... You act. You do other things. What do you want to do? Oh, acting. <laughs> My nose starts to bleed. <laughs> <laughs> Acting's so hard. Hmm. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> um, well, yeah. But yes, as a comedian, you're kind of like a multi-hyphenate because you write your own stuff, you direct your own stuff a lot of times, mm -hmm. and you perform your own stuff. And so, yeah. So it's more about, yeah, just like however I can reach people continuing to use those um, talents. <laughs> mm. So, you know, a, a TV show, I'm developing one right now, um, you know, to just, yeah, be able to like reach people in different ways. Some, because stand up isn't limiting. You really could tell any story through stand up comedy, I think. But like, like, you know, a TV show really can allow for the whole world to continue, I think, longer. Mm. And so, yeah, that's, yeah, TV show movie, you know, yeah, in different mediums showcasing my stories. Yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, for being with us. And um, if you have not checked out The Intruder, we highly, highly recommend it. Atsuko, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much for having me. Break it down. We're back with another segment sponsored by BetterHelp. We're joined once again by Hesu Joe, licensed therapist and head of clinical operations at BetterHelp. Today, we thought it would be fun to do a little rapid fire. Let's do it. All right. You ready? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What was your mother right about? Oh, um, uh, I, I had, let's see. What was she right about? <laughs> I had to, because then it's like on the spot. Like, <laughs> what was she right about? I <laughs> <laughs> That's staying um, in the edit. <laughs> she probably won't listen to this. <laughs> um, you know, like when I was younger, and I'm not that old right now, but when I was younger, I very much craved adventure and I was a thrill seeker and I constantly wanted to be doing something. I didn't like staying home on the weekends. Even after school, I wanted to like go out and do something, like take me somewhere, let me go the over here. And she used to tell me like, you know, as you get older, you will start seeking out stability. Hmm. You will seek out um, security. And the trade-off for those things is an increase in the number of boring days in your life. <laughs> and that sounded terrible to me at the time. But now as I'm getting a little bit older, it's like, oh my God, she was right. So huh. Nothing like a real. boring day. <laughs> yeah. Now I like love that stuff. I love a boring day. <laughs> I love not waking up at an alarm clock or just getting to kind of veg. Me too. Your mom was right. <laughs> what was your father right about? Um, so this was a, when I was younger also, um, I used to butt heads with both of my parents a lot. And, and my dad used to say this thing often of life is not about chasing happiness. Happiness isn't everything. Happiness is not the end all be all. There was just like this, you know, 
constant messaging that I was foolish for thinking I always wanted to be happy. Mm. And I think I'm saying happiness is not the main, should not be the main priority in your life. This is where I think he could have like continued on with that is life is about finding meaning. Life mm. is about finding value in things. Um, because if if you're happy all the time, then happiness doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, and it's important to be able to kind of embrace even the darker times in your life, the times that are colder, the times that are lonelier, more isolated, because these things have such stark contrast mm -hmm. to feeling joy and feeling deep connection with someone. Um, so that was what he was right about, is that like, you should, you, life is not, again, about like just trying to achieve happiness all the time and being happy all the time is not anybody's realistic goal. I should have asked this before. What did your parents do for a living? Um, so they're both professors. I was, was going to say, <laughs> your dad's like, I'm a clown, but never be happy. <laughs> they're both professors. Are they in the sciences? Um, no. So my mom is in linguistics, oh. um, and my dad is in finance. So wow. very practical person. Well, you are very well-spoken. I can't speak to your finances, but your mother, at least, seems to have had a very positive influence about it. Oh, thanks. Now <laughs> I'll have her listen. I mean, it's a very financial uh, <laughs> equation. You can't be happy That's all a, the time. I was, yeah. I was either going to guess that he was a clown or <laughs> something in finance. Sometimes he is. Um, what's the location that promotes your best mental health? Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's like a specific location per se. Um, I definitely like being outside with great weather, which is why I'll probably never leave California. Um, great weather is subjective. Do you mean sunny weather, no rain, no snow? I do like visiting snow, but I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think of it as like a specific location, but rather a set of lifestyle factors mm -hmm. um, that support mental wellness so that what, whatever location that you're in, you can feel good. And, and that set of lifestyle factors includes things I'm sure you've both talked about on your podcast before, but getting enough sleep, um, which you can only do that if you have good sleep hygiene. Um, and that means you're putting a concerted effort into going to bed at a certain time, which all of us are guilty of not doing that all the time. Some more than others. Yeah. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge to make yourself go to bed. It's been a challenge for us since we were small children. I don't want to mm. go. Something fun is going to happen. You know, and I still feel like that sometimes. I'm going to miss out on something exciting in the night world. Um, but very important to get good sleep. Um, and, you know, connecting meaningfully and enough with family, friends, chosen family, people that are important to you. Important connection with other humans it's very important. And sometimes that takes a lot of effort and energy. Um, and sometimes you don't want to, uh, but it's good to not listen to that part of you that doesn't want to all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I love animals. So if that's that's something that works out for you, I think it's important to surround yourself with things that you know to give you joy and to give you purpose and to give you meaning. Um, and for me, getting in regular movement. And that's not necessarily about like, wanting to look a certain way or that kind of stuff. But if I become sedentary for too long, I start getting lower back pain or I get a crick in my neck or I have all these aches and pains. And we all know if we are living with chronic physical pain, you can't be happy very much. It's just like, can't mm -hmm. even turn around. Someone says your name, you have to like, you know, turn your whole body. I don't feel my best in that kind of space. So to maintain overall mobility and feeling good in, in this body that I have um, it means moving it regularly. And when I incorporate all this stuff, then any location feels like a great place. As long as it's between 68 and 72 degrees. Yes. Um, do you have a mantra? Um, or a, a saying that you would like to share? Yeah. I don't, I don't know how true this is. The internet says that Abraham Lincoln says it, but I don't, I don't know if Most that's true. Most folks are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. Well, that's a good one. But that is an Abraham whatever Lincoln. you are, be a good one. Oh, <laughs> that's nice. I like that. Who's been your greatest spiritual teacher? Um, a few have come to mind with that. Um, but for me, like, my life has very much transformed when I went to therapy school, when I decided to become a therapist. And so two of the professors I had during that program, one was my advisor. Um, you know, I don't think I would have normally thought of professors, academic instructors as being spiritual leaders. Um, but when I hear that, I have to think about what is a spiritual leader or teacher? Um, and I, I realize for me, it's somebody that's helped me reconnect with the truth of who I am. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I had very influential professors in my grad school time. Um, I have a long time yoga teacher turned friend now, and she 
has also become a great spiritual teacher to me. Like for folks that haven't tried yoga and you think it's very hoo-hoo, um, there is something to be said about the mind-body connection. And yoga is a fantastic way to practice paying attention to breath and paying attention to your body, learning about proprioception, which means like, my brain says my hand and my leg are over there. Is that true? Like being able to make those connections and be very aware of your body allows you to also start paying better attention to when something is off and when something is weird. Um, you know, like going to bed all scrunched up and like <laughs> not very comfortable maybe. I feel like out right now. <laughs> people that aren't mindful of the mind-body connection, they never relax and they probably aren't getting good sleep. And if you're not getting good sleep, you're exhausted, fatigued. And, you know, not showing up in the best way. Have you had a moment of best intuition? Coming here today. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joining the BetterHelp team. Best intuition. <laughs> you know, that's, I did think of that actually as, as um, maybe an answer. I don't want to say that my life has been defined by this one job. But when I joined BetterHelp, it was a very small startup. Um, less than a couple dozen people. And... You know, I, I grew up in San Jose, which is in Silicon Valley. So I know this this idea of startup does really well and then it goes away and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I mentioned that my parents are professors. So they're the kinds of people that went into a job and stayed there for 30 years. And they think that that is the way <laughs> that is that is how you find success, stability, financial security in your life is to just get tenured and to never leave. <laughs> um, so even them, like, the idea of me going to a startup was very scary for them. But something inside me, there's, like, intuition. It's not about better help. It's about online therapy. It's mm -hmm. about a different delivery service for these services. It's about making mental health service more accessible. Um, it's about, you know, doing it in a medium that is familiar to people. There's so many communities of people out there that would have maybe never tried therapy if the online piece wasn't an option for them. Mm -hmm. So the intuition for me was like, I think this is potentially a direction therapy is going to go. And even though I had my parents saying like, it's very risky. What if this startup doesn't mm -hmm. take off? Like, do you have money saved up? Um, advisors in school, very skeptical of this direction. It's like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, this doesn't sound like real therapy is the messaging I got at that time. Um, but against the advice and the wisdom of people I greatly respect something, this was the intuition, right, said, like, just try it. See what happens. And who are you most competitive with? I would say it, it's context specific. Most of the time, I'm not actually very competitive. I'm not super ambitious. Um, outside of work, even, like, like I said, I love to veg. I love watching TV. I love chilling. I love, like, you know, I have dogs and we're active, but I also like just sitting there with them. <laughs> um, so... The competitive thing is it's inside of me, but on a day to day, I'm not really thinking about like, gotta smash this goal or meet this whatever <laughs> and beat that guy. But like put me in kind of sports or in a kind of board game, then I get like ugly competitive. <laughs> and it's not about a specific person. I just want to win. So that's like, yeah. You should see mine on the pickleball court. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm a mess. Um, I'd like to thank our partners at BetterHelp for sponsoring this segment and to you, Hesu Joe, licensed therapist and head of clinical operations at BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash break to learn more. That's betterhelp.com slash break. Hesu Joe's input is general psychological information based on research and clinical experience. It's intended to be general and informational in nature. It does not represent or indicate an established clinical or professional relationship with those inquiring for guidance. Also, just because you might hear something on the show that sounds similar to what you're experiencing, beware of self-diagnosis. Diagnosis is not required to find relief, and you'll want to find a qualified professional to assess and explore diagnoses if that's important to you. If you or a loved one are in crisis and uncertain of whether you can maintain safety, reach out for support. Crisis hotlines, local authorities have a safety plan that can be done with a therapist too. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one fiction. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. 